uh, for them. Uh, Brother Eddie's going to be leaving here right after the service. He's got to preach again at Fellowship tonight. They start their missions conference uh, tonight, I believe. And so uh, please remember him as you pray and ask the Lord to bless. I'm thankful for what the Lord did for me as a 13-year-old boy. I remember that Sunday night. It didn't. It it didn't just happen that Sunday night. It had started in my mama's bedroom years before that Sunday night, as she would pray with my brother and I, and uh, I can almost hear her. She would close her prayer, and she'd pray something like this: "God, please save my boys. Don't let them go to hell." My brother and I were both saved that Sunday night uh, in, an, in an old-fashioned church. And somebody said, how long did it take you to get saved? Did you get saved when you went to the altar? I, I don't know when I got saved. Probably when I moved out of the pew. That first step was a step of command. Most people get saved between the pew and the altar. Uh, if, you're looking, if you're looking for a feeling or... Uh, seeing lightning flash in the sky, you're, go you're going to be waiting a long, long time because that's not going to happen. S salvation comes through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when an act of faith reaches out and takes hold of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the moment you're saved. It all happened in a moment when I trusted Him as my Savior. Listen to the words of this old song. The moment I knelt down upon my knees in prayer Was the moment a beggar became a rightful heir He came to live within this heart of mine And he filled me with glory divine It happened that very moment he saved my soul My name was recorded in the book of life in heaven My sin was washed away by the blood of Calvary Since the day that the blood was applied forever I stand just Defined. It happened that very moment he saved my soul. I'll never get over this grace so rich and free. The longer I live, the more it amazes me. How that just in one moment of time all the joys of heaven then be came mine. And it happened that very moment he saved my soul. My name was recorded in the book of life in heaven my sin was washed away by the blood of calvary since the day that the blood was applied forever i stand just defied happened that very moment he saved my soul. Amen. Brother Eddie, come preach to us. I covet these preachers that can preach and sing. It just aggravates the life out of me. And uh, <laughs> one of these days when I get to heaven, maybe I'll be able to do a little of both of those. I really do, but I appreciate that. What a blessing that was. I, every time I, I come to a church and fill in for a pastor, a lot of times the pastor isn't there, uh, but uh, uh, the, the idea is still the same. I think of an illustration that years ago, I heard, and I think it fits my, my style of preaching. This fellow went to fill in for a pastor, and he was trying to explain the way he felt and what he was going on in his heart. And he said, I, he said, you know, I grew up in the country, and so we had those windows with different panes in them, you know, had the break and the wood in them. And he said, 
uh, he said, and we'd be out in the yard playing ball and said we'd throw a ball through one of those panes of glass. And he said, until we could get that glass replaced, we had put a piece of cardboard in there. And it just kind of keep the weather out. And he said, uh, that's kind of the way I feel. He said, I'm filling in for your pasture and I feel like I'm just a piece of cardboard just filling in the hole. And uh, after the service was over, this sweet little lady came to him and said, uh, Preacher, I just want you to know today you are not a piece of cardboard, you are a real pain. So, <laughs> so I'm going to do my best to do that today, amen. I want to be a real pain. I want to do the best I can. I have two motives when I feel in for a preacher, and, and I mean this sincerely. I have, number one, the motive to preach the Word of God. I desire to do that. I desire to honor God in His Word. Secondly, as I desire to make the congregation appreciate their pastor and to love their pastor. I was preaching years ago down in Chickamauga for a pastor friend of mine and they were giving their preacher a little bit of a hard time and I just went and preached and after the service was over, this woman came to me. She said, oh, now that's the kind of preaching we like around here. That's what we're used to. And she went on to say, I wish <laughs> you was our pastor. After I made this next statement, she changed her mind. I said, after about two weeks of me, you'd be wanting your former pastor back. <laughs> Amen. And uh, I, I don't have any use somebody that would uh, uh, tear down their own pastor. I have no use for them. And I appreciate the fact that you love your preacher and I hope that you'll always honor him and show him and Miss Janet the, the grace that they deserve and the ministry that, for the ministry they're in. Take your Bibles tonight and turn to Luke 22. I will be scurrying out. I, this is one of those sermons that if it goes well, I wish I could stay around and shake hands with you and fellowship and talk about how good it was. If it don't go so well, I'm glad I'm leaving. Amen. <laughs> so we just we just have to see how it goes. All right, you understand that? They sometimes I preach and I thought I sure wished I could say every head bowed, every eye closed, and when you open your eyes, I'm gone. I really, and I hope this ain't one of those nights. Amen. But let's look, if you will, let's stand to our feet. We're only going to read a couple of, about four or five verses tonight. We read these this morning. We read the first part of the chapter. I want to begin in verse 31, and I want to read down through verse 34. This is the message that God began to work in my heart on whenever I began developing this, these two messages. This is the part of the message that I believe that is so needful in this day in which we're living, especially the last point of the message. It has been something that God has used to help me and encourage me. But look at what he said in verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I pray for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and unto death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. This is not an unfamiliar passage of scripture to any of us who've been in church for any time at all. We all know the story of Peter and his denial of the Lord. And this is not, I'm probably going to, say, I'm not going to share anything with you that you haven't heard in the past, but it's just something that I believe that is so needful to be reminded of along the journey. This morning we began looking at this thought that Jesus knows. And we come back and we looked in verses 10 and 11 and how, how Jesus knows our situation. We talked about in the first uh, verse 3 and following how Jesus knows who is a sinner. Then we talked about that Jesus knows who is the, uh, uh, he knows the saint. Talked about the contention that was between the brethren. Tonight I want to deal with this thought, Jesus knows Simon. Jesus knows Simon. Now Father, we ask you that you would help us tonight as we stand before this congregation of people people to be a blessing and to be a help. Lord, I've done as best I know how to prepare for this hour, but God, the truth is all the preparation in the world that I could give would not be uh, good enough to do effectively to preach the word of God unless there is the power of the Holy Spirit that rests upon it. We thank you for what you did in the heart of people this morning, and I'm grateful that you're still stirring and moving. But God, we need you again tonight. We need you desperately. I know that Brother Pinion desires his people to be fed from the word of God. He desires his own 
soul to be fed and I pray tonight that when we finish this service and we go to the house, Lord, that we'll leave with a full spiritual stomach having heard from you and we'll thank you for it, for asking in Christ's name and for his sake we pray, amen. You can be seated. As I said this evening, I wanna preach to you on this thought, uh, the Lord knows Simon. And these verses this morning, I began musing about what I was going to, uh, to preach on this morning and tonight and talking to you about the fact that we need to not just theoretically know and not just theologically know, but we need to practically know that, God, that Jesus knows where we are, what we're facing, what we're dealing with, where we're going. If you're like me, you're, you, you don't have a clue what's ahead for us. I'm honest with you when I look ahead and I think about this uh, uh, currency situation and all that's going on and they're trying to do away with, uh, uh, with uh, money that we have, you know, bank, uh, uh, bank accounts with, with uh, cash money in it. They're trying to do away with that and trying to put us on a, uh, uh, on a situation to where we have to have debit cards and what have you. That concerns me. Now, I use a debit card all the time and I, I'm not saying you shouldn't use them, but I'm saying what they're wanting to do, obviously, is to get us away from a cash world and a cash environment so that they can control us in every aspect of the world. And that concerns me. I, 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 I told you this morning, it concerns me. But what can bring peace to my heart in the midst of all of these concerns is I know that Jesus knows. He knows exactly what we're gonna face. He knows exactly when we're gonna face it. He knows exactly what we need to have done in our lives so we can face it. The Lord knows. And so I'm grateful for that. But tonight I want to turn up the page, if you will, and look in verse 31 and, and following and I want to talk to you on this thought, the Lord knows Simon. I think if you think about this and you read your Bible, this is one of the most descriptive portions of scripture that demonstrate how Satan works against the people of God. I don't know of any other scripture that you can read that gives us a better a succinct detail on how Satan fights against us as children of God. To be sure, we see in the life of Job, uh, that Satan worked against him. We see in the life of David that Satan worked against him. We see in others in the scripture. We could talk about Thomas. We could talk about others in scripture, how the devil worked against them. But this little passage of scripture to me just shares with us just a, a, just a capsule of truth about how the devil works against us as the people of God. There are four things that I want to look at from these uh, few verses that I I believe that we need to acknowledge and understand in our life. Again, I don't want to just look at this from a, uh, from a uh, uh, theoretical uh, perspective or a theological perspective. I want to look at it from a practical perspective. I, uh, my son Mitchell, who's doing mission work in Turkey, uh, one day he and I were talking and he said, you know, he said, Dad, I, 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 there's just all kind of different preachers and all kind of different messages. And, and uh, he said, you know, there's some that are just real sound theologically and they're good and I'm for them. He said there's some that are, you know, that really take you to the depths of the word of God and I'm for them and he and I were talking and uh, I said, well, how would you, I shouldn't ask this, not your own son anyhow. I said, how would you describe my preaching? He said, 99.9% .9 practical. He said, that's what you do. He said, you just look at things from a practical perspective. Well, and I, I want to do these other things but I do believe that we need to understand that this practical aspect of living for Jesus has answers from the word of God. And I believe that the Christian life is a practical life. Now sometimes I have to step out on faith and do things that makes no sense to us, but at the same time, it's practical to learn how to deal with those things. Now, let me show you four things tonight about this life of, of Simon. First of all, I want you to see Satan's plan. Go back again with me and read in verse 31. The Lord said unto Simon, Simon, he said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that it may sift you as weak. As I was sitting in the office this afternoon after we got home for a few moments, I began to think about this uh, and think about what the Lord said to Simon here. It is obvious that Satan had appeared before the Lord to try to attack Simon Peter. We know that this is a track record that Satan has. We did it in the life of Job. And he said, how did the Lord know that Simon or that Satan was going to do this because obviously Satan had revealed his purpose to 
the Lord Jesus. Now, uh, think about this. Satan has a plan. I'm afraid that our world has either come to the place to where they deny the existence of Satan or we've become apathetic in, the, in our Christian lives and we think that Satan is a, is a dormant enemy and he's not working today. I want you to understand that Satan is alive and well. He is doing as much against the cause of Christ and working as hard against the Christian as he ever has. I don't believe that it's right to give Satan a lot of recognition. I, I just don't do that. I, I believe we need to exalt the Lord Jesus. However, at the same time, we ought to understand the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 2 verse 11, he said, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So I believe that we've got to have that correct balance. I believe that, they, uh, that we ought to exalt the Lord Jesus, but not be ignorant of the work that Satan is doing against us. We need to understand some things about Satan and the way that he works. Satan often works subtly. He's behind the scenes. He manipulates and he controls and the situation to accomplish his purpose and his goals. I think we've all experienced that. We think, where in the world did that come from? And it was Satan. He's working subtly. He's working in the dark. He's working uh, uh, in ways that we don't think about. But not on that, we know that Satan also works uh, out in the open. He's bold about his uh, his wickedness. And we've never seen it like we're seeing it today. I mean, this depraved world, you'd think that they'd be ashamed. But the Bible said they were not at all ashamed. And that's where we are. We're in a world of wickedness and shame. And the devil is working in openness now. Demonic power is on display. You don't have to go far to find that. I mentioned this morning and uh, uh, it, uh, or this afternoon at lunch that this past week in East Ridge High School, they had a sub, uh, East, one of the East Ridge schools, I believe it was middle school, they had a, uh, a teacher that substituted there that is a, a man dressed up like a woman with, uh, with uh, pink and red hair and demanding that she be respected and called a ma'am or called a lady. We're, we're not talking about out in California, though it's certainly happening there. We're talking about right here in the buckle of the Bible Belt. We're talking about in East Ridge, Tennessee, that where we used to have the largest church, one of the largest churches in the nation called Highland Park Baptist Church, where the gospel had been preached from, from street to street, from church to church, from house to house, and yet we're seeing this in our own world, and the problem is, is demonic power is on display today. We need to understand that we've got an enemy that we're having to deal with. Now, Satan works against the Christian. He takes our strength. This is one of the things I see in the life of Peter. He takes our strengths, and he uses them against us, and, 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 uh, and it, 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 we can try to, uh, when he does that, one of the things he does, he'll either cause us to stumble and fall, or he desires to make us a super spiritual Pharisee. Amen. He said, the devil, if he can't get me to fall, he's just as happy if I'm a super spiritual Pharisee because my life has no impact on anyone on either of those uh, on either of those ends. Now think about this: if you study many of the great saints of God in the Bible, you're going to find out that that that, that many of them fail or failed in the area of their strength. In other words, if you think about this, they do not fall at their weakest point. They fail at their strongest point. Have you ever thought about this? Think about it. They fail at the strongest point. Think about David for a moment. David's strongest point was his integrity. He was a man of integrity. He did that which was right. And how did the devil get him? He got him in his integrity. Whenever he looked at Bathsheba and he lusted after her and he took her to himself and he committed adultery with her and she became uh, pregnant with his child and then he had the, uh, the soldier, her husband killed on the front lines. How did the devil attack David? He attacked him where he was the strongest in his integrity. He also, another example, how did he attack Abraham? He attacked Abraham in his strength of his faith. I mean, Abraham left the herd of the Chaldees not knowing where he was going. All he knew is God said, hey, let's go. And Abraham said, yes, sir, I'm on board, let's go. And yet whenever he comes now and his wife, I mentioned it this morning, his, his wife now comes in the, in the, with him and now was it uh, uh, one, of the, one of the, I can't remember what king it was, but he, he saw Sarah and she was a beautiful woman to look on. And what did Abraham do? He failed in his faith. He was afraid to say she has 
my wife because he said, I'm afraid that they will kill me for your sake. Now think about this. I don't know what your spiritual strength is, but that you can mark her down, Satan's gonna attack you with that. I don't know what your spiritual strength is. I don't know where you stand strong. I don't know if it's integrity. I don't know if it's faith. <coughs> I don't know if it's your prayer life. I don't know if it's your, your discerning of scripture. I don't know where your strength is, but you mark her down, the, uh, the devil knows where your strength is and he will attack you at the place that you're the strongest on. He'll attack you because he wants to destroy you and if he can destroy you there, he has won the victory. Now here we find Peter's strongest point was his courage. Just a few chapters uh, uh, later, uh, uh, before this rather, we're gonna find that the Bible said, or, well, I'm sorry, it was after this, the Bible said that Peter drew off his sword and cut off the ear of the high priest, did he not? I mean, he said, I, you're not taking my Lord. You're not gonna take my Savior. He was a man of courage. He was a man who stood for what was right. And yet we find that later on down the road that the Bible said that Peter cursed and denied that he knew the Lord. The devil attacked him where he was the strongest. And I'm not trying to discourage you for not being strong, but I'm telling you that you need to be careful about your strengths. Can I tell you something? There's one area of my life that I'm pretty strong in, and that is this. If I believe something, I believe with all my heart. I am stubborn. <laughs> Once I get something settled in my soul, I'm stubborn. And that's like one fellow said, Lord, he said, you better make me right the first time because you know I'm too stubborn to change. <laughs> Amen. Can I tell you, I believe that stubbornness and believing right and doing right is a strength. I believe it's a needed strength, but my strength can become my weakness if I get so stubborn and I get so set in my ways that I don't allow God to change me. Amen? See, you, uh, you say, well, what is my strength? I don't know, but I know this, the devil knows, and he's gonna attack you with your strength. Oswald Chambers said this, an unguarded strength is a double weakness. He said, if you don't guard that strength, it is a double weakness in our lives. Satan is known in scripture by many names. Each name gives us insight on the way he works and what he does. He's known as Satan, that means adversary or enemy. He's known as the devil, that means a slanderer. He's known as the deceiver. The Bible said he's the father of lies. He's known as the serpent, that means he's poisonous. He's known as the destroyer, which is his ultimate goal to destroy mankind. He's known as the evil one, that pretty self-explanatory. He's known as a tempter. How many of you know that to be true? And the point that I'm making is this, Satan is alive and well in this world and Satan desires to have us that it may sift us at wheat. Satan has a plan for every sinner but Satan also has a plan for every saint. You see, I believe that Satan's plan, and I know from scripture his plan for the sinner is to damn their soul to hell for all eternity, to burn in hell forever and ever and ever with no escape and no reprieve and no, uh, no way to get out. That is Satan's plan for the sinner. But he also has a plan for the saint of God. When you got saved, you, didn't, you, you need not think that the devil uh, is gonna ignore you and let you alone. If you're serving God and you're on the front lines fighting the battle and serving the Lord Jesus, you mark her down. The devil's taking notice and he is your enemy and he's out to destroy you. Look at verse 31. Is it Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. We recognize the devil wants us, but what does he wanna do with us? He wants to sift us as wheat. You see, think about this. The devil cannot rob us of eternal life. Amen. The devil's not working to get me unsaved. That's an impossibility. The devil is not working to damn my soul to hell. That's an impossibility. But he is working to sift me. He is working to sift my life. What does what that mean? Well, in Bible days and even our childhood days, we that are a little older know what sifting is. My mom had a sifter and a big old, uh, big old uh, a canister of flour under the sink and when she'd make them big old biscuits on Saturday morning, she'd get that sifter, dip it down in that, in that flour and she would sift it and get the impurities out. In Bible days, they winnowed wheat. 
And what they would do, they'd take the wheat, they'd put it on this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, apparatus and they would throw it up in the air in the wind and the wind would take away the shaft and leave the wheat. And the Lord used that to illustrate to us what the devil is doing in our lives. Now, why would Satan sift us? I want to give you two thoughts. First thought I want you to know before we go any further is this. Satan cannot sift us without he goes by God and gets permission to do that. Amen. You need to remember that because that's going to become very important when we get to our next point. Yes. So why does Satan sift us? Well, let's talk about it from his perspective. I believe Satan wants to sift us to bring out our imperfections so that he'll have something to accuse us before the Father with. And so that we lose our testimony in a lost and dying world so that we don't have the power of God upon our lives so he, he sifts us to show the whole world our inconsistencies and to show the whole world our wickedness. He wants to ruin our testimonies. That's what Satan's purpose is. When you go to work tomorrow and somebody does you wrong and you want to react in a wicked way, you know what Satan's doing? He's sifting you. He's trying to get you to respond in a wicked way so that you will hurt your testimony, so that your work up, uh, people around you will never see Christ in your life. That is what Satan's doing. He wants to damn souls to hell and since he can't damn you to hell, what he wants to do is damn those that you know around you to hell. And he does that by sifting as a pastor, I've seen people come to me and say things like, does so-and-so attend your church? And I'd say, yeah, well, I've seen them over here and this is what they were doing and this is what they did. I want to tell you what they're doing is they're being sifted by Satan and these people that see that see the hypocrisy of Christianity. Secondly, let's look at this sitting from God's perspective. Why does the Lord allow Satan to do this? Is God not a God with all, with all power? Can he not say, hey, no, Satan, you're not gonna do it? Let me tell you why I believe that God allows this to happen in our lives. The sifting of Satan will show us things in our lives that we didn't even know were there. That's why God allows it to happen. Because if we don't listen to the Holy Spirit of God and we don't respond to the convicting power of the word of God, we leave God no, uh, no other option than to allow us to be sifted so that it'll bring to the surface wickedness that's in our own hearts, in our own lives. I've been sifted by Satan many times. And I'm ashamed that he could take my sin to the Father and accuse me before the Father. But can I tell you, I'm so grateful that when our sifting comes that the Holy Ghost says that you see that in your life, you didn't know it was there, but I, it's there and caused me to repent of my sin and forget, I get forgiveness. You see, if we're not careful, we'll excuse the little things. It's no big deal. But it's the little things that leads to the bigger things, that leads to the bigger things, that leads to the devastating things. And what the Lord does, he allows sifting to come to show it. See, the shaft was, was just small. But I'll tell you what, if we'll if we will respond to the sifting and see those small sins, those little foxes that are spoiling the vines of our lives. We see the sifting, uh, we see the sifting, if you will, of, of Peter. But now notice this. Notice the Savior's prayer. Look in verse 32. Let me say this. As much as I hate verse 31, I sure do love verse 32. <laughs> Verse 31 said, Satan had desired to have you that they sift you as wheat. That crushes me, it hurts me. I wish it weren't so, but blessed be God. Wouldn't you, aren't you glad that verse 32 is in the book? Wouldn't it be horrible if all we had was verse 31 and the Lord says, all right, that's all on that topic. No, he gave us verse 32, he said, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. The Lord looked ahead a few hours down the road. Think about it. Oh, we've, we've got to somehow get a, our minds and focus on spiritual things and think about these things. He saw Peter warming himself by the fires of the enemy. But he said, I prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. 
Well, if it were me, I'd probably say something like, you sorry dog, I know what you're going to do. Hello? I know you may be more spiritual than I am. <laughs> you sorry excuse for a Christian. I know what you're going to, I know you're going to curse and deny that you know me. Man, you're not worth uh, two, two dead flies. <laughs> Man, that's not what Jesus did. Jesus saw his denial. He heard his curse words. He saw the miserable failure that he was. And he said, but I prayed for thee. What a blessed Lord. What a wonderful Lord. This struck me. Isn't it interesting that the Lord did not say that, that he prayed that Peter would not fail? He said, I pray that your faith doesn't fail. Yeah. Now, the Lord knew that Peter, as painful as it was going to be, and as hard as it was going to be for Peter, the disciples, and the Lord, he knew that Peter's failure had a purpose in that failure. Yeah. We're going to talk about that when we get to the end of the message. We see the Lord praying. He said, I prayed for thee. The Lord prayed for Peter before the sifting ever took place. I don't encourage you. He said, oh, preacher, I'm being sifted right now. There is a Lord Jesus in heaven who's interceding with you with the Father, and he's already praying for you. And he prayed for you before it ever started. Every day we have a Savior that's praying for us. He's going to the Father on our behalf. Think about it. We pray. I mean, we fail. He prays for us. We sin. He prays for us. Think about it. We disobey his word. He prays for us. What a wonderful Savior. He prays for us. In Romans 8, 34, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who even is said, even at the right hand of the God, who maketh intercession for us. When we sin, he says to the Father, Father, don't look at their sin. Look at my blood. My blood atoned for their sin. We see the Lord's praying. We see the Lord's promise. He said, I pray for thee that thy faith fail not. He was saying, Peter, when you mess up in a few hours, and when you deny me and curse in that denial, he said, I'm praying that your faith will not fail. I don't know about you. I can only ex express this from my perspective. But how many times have I sinned and I thought, I just can't get back up this time. I so discouraged myself, so disappointed in myself. I did something I never thought I'd do. I said something I never thought I'd say. I responded the way I never thought I'd respond. And I'm so embarrassed and I thought, I just don't think I can get up. But then there's Jesus at the right hand of the Father saying, Father, Eddie's discouraged. He's messed up. Would you let the Holy Spirit stir his soul? Would you help him have the strength to get up and try again? And guess what happened? I got up and tried again. He's praying for us. You say, well, I ain't never been that bad. Well, hang around. You probably will be someday. See, he prayed that our faith would not fail. In Mer there have been days in my life that I've, not, uh, that I've not been faithful. But even in my lack of faithfulness, he's never failed. You see, there have been days I've sinned and grieved the heart of God, but he never failed me. In my life, there have been days that I said things I never thought I'd say, did things I never thought I'd do, but he never failed me. And can I say this? I messed up, but my faith never failed. I kept getting up. I kept serving. I kept repenting. I kept on working for the Lord Jesus and reading his word. That makes me know that I'm saved because the Bible said, he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. I may stumble and bumble and fall to pieces, but thank God there's something in me that causes me to keep on going. What is it? It's Jesus 
praying for me. I remember years ago, I got to hurry because I don't know where you got to go, but I know where I got to go. <laughs> but I remember I was in Florida pastoring Bethel Baptist Church. <clears throat> and I called on one of my men to pray over the offering. And it was just like God opened it up in my heart. This man was praying for the offering. He was praying for the church service. And then he called my name in prayer. And it was like heaven exploded inside of me. And I thought, here's a man walking in the presence of God with my name on his lips. And boy, it thrilled me. I mean, I, I, I mean I'm serious for the Lord. I like to shout in my guts out that morning. But then, boy, what really got good is when I got to thinking about there's someone besides that frail failure of a man who takes my name before the Father. It's the, it's the man, the Lord Jesus, who takes my name every day before the Father. I'm glad, thank God, for verse 32 where he said, I pray for thee that thy faith fail not. Look in verse 33, we see Simon's pride. Peter said to the Lord, not so, Lord. And I, others may deny you, but not be me. You don't have to worry about me, Lord. You can count on me. Look, we'll read the text. It says, and he said unto him, Lord, I'm ready to go with thee both into prison and unto death. Well, the other gospel writer said that Peter said, though everybody else should forsake you, it won't be me. You can count on me, Lord. How many times have I said those same words? Oh, I, I would never fail. It couldn't happen to me, but it can happen to you. I believe that Peter meant that at the moment. I do. I believe that Peter was not being a hypocrite. I believe that Peter believed in all of his heart that he would not fail his Lord. But can I tell you, believing with all of our heart that we won't fail don't mean we won't fail. Have you ever noticed how easy it is to criticize people who fall and people who have a failure in their family until they have a failure in their family and all of a sudden it's a different story? Yeah. Yes, sir. Have you ever noticed that? Right. And I'm afraid that we, we learn how to look down our super spiritual noses at people who fail and we, we know how to criticize, but then whenever the chickens come home to roost, we think, good night, now I understand. Simon's pride I believe that Peter desired to please the Lord. I believe he desired to stay faithful to God, but he failed. I think there are three things that we see in this chapter that led to Peter's failure. You can write them down if you'd like. Pride or self-confidence. Pride is always just the gateway to destruction. You can think it'll never happen to you all you want to, but I got news for you. It can happen to you. Peter never dreamed that he would be an illustration in a preacher's sermon someday. And if he was, he didn't think it would be a bad illustration. He probably thought, well, boy, when they talk about me down through the years, they're going to talk about, boy, Peter, that apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And certainly we ought to talk about that because he was. But he never dreamed that he would have the testimony that he failed and cursed that he knew the Lord. I want us to recognize this truth. Failure happens in the lives of Christians that are a lot better Christians than you and me. I'm thinking of a preacher right now that I preached with in camp meetings. Tremendous success in pastoring ministry. God used him greatly. I mean, he had that ability to just, just take the congregation and grab them and drink, bring them in to the word of God. I'm thinking of him today. He's out of the ministry, barely keeping his home together, all because it could not happen to him. But it did. And you see, we can allow these little signs of pride and self-confidence to go unchecked in our lives. We got to deal with them because Satan is going to sift us in those areas of our life. Prayerlessness led to Peter's denial. In verse 40 and 46, you'll find the Bible said that whenever Peter, uh, whenever the Lord took the disciples out to pray, the Bible said that Peter and other disciples slept. 
I'm going to just touch on this and go on. Every failure I have in my Christian life is a prayer failure. Every failure. I've been thinking about it a lot lately. Where's that old time power that we used to have in our churches? Where's that conviction where people would walk into the building and they would fall under conviction of being lost and dying and going to hell? And the invitation would be given and they would grip the pews with white fingernails because they were under conviction. What's happened? I'll tell you what's happened. It's our prayerlessness. That's what's happened. You say, well, yeah, you preachers need to pray. Yeah, you people do too. Amen? I'm not trying to be mean. I'm being honest. Yes, you better know we preachers need to pray. But this kind of power that we used to have didn't come about by people praying, now lay me down to sleep prayers. It come by people spending time in fasting and spending time alone with God and begging God for his intervention and mercy. A Christian does not pray to the Lord will become a prey of Satan. You mark her down. Then there's a third thing that I think caused Peter to fail and that's his fleshly courage. We go talk about a while ago. He took off his sword, verse 50, and he cut off the, high, uh, the, 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 the priest's uh, uh, ear. I mean, he was, he was working in the energy of the flesh. Can I remind you of this? The best way you can fail as a Christian is work in the energy of your flesh. Peter took things in his own hands and dealt with things in a fleshly realm instead of a spiritual realm. That is one of the greatest battles that I had to fight. Because <laughs> I told you I'm stubborn. And I just want to put, sometime I want to put people in a headlock and roll around in the gravels. Hello? <laughs> now you may be more spiritual than I am, but I'm just telling you, I get frustrated with stupidity. Oh, well, maybe I need to go to the altar before I leave tonight. I don't know. <sighs> That's flesh. And it is flesh that will destroy us. Peter was not walking the Spirit when he said, I don't know this man. He was not walking the Spirit when he cursed and said, I don't know him. No, when we walk in the flesh, we take things in our own hands, we are a target for people, for Satan and his destruction in our life. But let me show you this and I'll be done. We not only see this fact about Peter and his, his pride and we see the, uh, the prayer of Jesus and we see the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the sin that Peter committed or, uh, that, that he had or the plan of Satan. But notice this last thing. We see a scriptural principle. I love verse 32. This is where honestly the burden of this message was birthed. The Lord said in the latter part of verse 32, I pray for thee, and here's the phrase, that thy faith fail not. No, I'm sorry, the next phrase. When thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. I often, when I'm dealing with people, I'll use that verse an awful lot. Because what the Lord is saying is to Peter, you're going to get past this. You're going to get past it. Can I tell you, if you're saved, you may be of wallowing in sin at the moment, but if you're saved, you're going to get past it. You're going to get past it. Now, he said, now, Peter, when you get past it, strengthen the brethren. Here's what the Lord was saying to Peter. He was saying, you take what you learn from this tragedy in your life and you use it to strengthen someone else that's coming down the road that you traveled. I want, to, I want you to understand, this is certainly an application from the scripture here about if we falter and fall in sin and falter in our, in our wickedness, whenever God re, uh, restores us and we get back in fellowship, 
We need to use what we learned and those falters and those failures to help others that have fallen. You know what happens when you fall? All the pride is gone. Everybody knows about it. I, I'll just share this illustration. And that's not to be critical at all of past failures. But it's to exalt what I believe the Lord will have us understand. Many years ago, David Howe, Jack Howe's son, fell into sin. And it broke, no doubt, the dad's heart. It broke everybody's heart. And it took a while for restoration, but today, David Howells has a ministry down in Georgia, Cochrane, Georgia. His ministry is restoring the fallen. Tell you why? Because he's been there. He knows what the falling feels like. Now let me share this with you and I'm, I'm, I'm done. I believe we ought to help folks when we fall and we falter. We ought to help folks that are, have fallen the same way we have because we know what they're feeling. We know what they're dealing with. But let's turn this another, uh, uh, over just a little bit and think about this. When God allows tragedy and heartache to come into your life, when you get through it, help somebody else that's going through it. I won't go into detail, but my first wife of 37 years developed brain cancer when she was 42 years old. For 13 years, she battled brain cancer. The last seven years, we had to give her 24-7 care in our, in our home until the last six months, and we just could no longer care for her at home. We had to put her in a nursing home, and I'm honest with you, I begged God to let her die before we had to put her in a nursing home. I didn't want to have to do that. But it's what it was. I thought before this cancer invaded my family, I could comfort people. But I know how to comfort them now. When I go to a funeral home and there's a husband standing there with his wife laying in the casket, I know how to hurt with that person. I know how to carry that burden. You see... Whatever we face, you say, well, you know, preacher, I've, you know, I, I, I developed cancer and God delivered me and I'm, I'm, I'm now don't have any sign of cancer in my body. Then take what you've learned and strengthen the brethren with it. Ministry, ministry. You have a child that broke your heart. And they've gotten right with the Lord. And you know the heaviness of that child that broke your heart. Find somebody else who has a child who's broken their heart. Minister to them. That's what the Lord is telling Peter. He said, when you get through this, now you help those that's going to face what you faced. I don't know what you faced in your life, but it wasn't by accident. Whenever Jill was really bad sick, to be frank with you, for the most part, I faced it alone. For the most part, few folks come to visit. Now, the church I pastored loved her and cared for us, but I'm talking about as far as friends and relatives. And the reason is because when they come, they didn't even know what to say. It wasn't that they didn't love us. So they just didn't know what to say. But can I tell you that now, from my perspective, when I walk into the room and I see them weeping, I don't have to say anything. I can just sit and weep with them because I want to be doing what the Lord said to Peter. When you're converted, strengthen the brethren. You got a ministry. That's good preaching, amen? You've got a ministry. God allowed these things to come your way. You've got a ministry. Use it. 
use it. The world is hurting. They need somebody. Somebody that will just come up beside them and put their arm around them and say, look, I can't fix it, but I want you to know I love you. And I'm praying for you, and I'm here. If you need a shoulder to cry on, here I am. Oh, I gotta quit because I gotta go preach. <laughs> I gotta quit preaching so I can go preach. <laughs> Amen. Strengthen the brethren. Father, Lord, you know what was needed today, and I felt very led led by the Lord to prepare and preach this message to this congregation. And as tonight as I have stood before this congregation of people, I have felt the touch of the Holy Spirit in my heart as I preached. Now God, I pray that you'd touch everyone, do in their heart with this message that, that you set it out to do. And I will thank you for asking it in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I'm just going to take a moment or two and ask you to do this. I'm going to ask for a show of hands or anything. But if you're being sifted today, and if you've, fall, fall, if you've fallen in this sifting, why don't you get in your heart and mind today that Jesus is praying for you and come and make it right with him Learn from your mistakes or learn from your heartaches, whatever they may be, and then go out and strengthen the brethren. So as Miss Janet plays, this altar call is extended. You do what the Lord have you do tonight. Would you stand with me quietly tonight as Miss Janet plays? God spoke into your heart. You need to come here, sit on the front pew and pray. You need to meet the Lord here or right there where you are. Why don't you talk to him about where you are tonight and what's going on in your life? I, listen, I know. I know. I, I have lived the reality of what Brother Eddie was preaching tonight. And through living the reality of that truth, I could tell you some things tonight just in recent days where God has allowed me to be in a place to help some folks that are walking in the steps that I've already walked in. And just to tell them, God knows about all of it. He knows where you are. He knows what's going on. And I want to tell you, He's there to give you help if you'll look to Him. Why don't you ask the Lord to help you, help you tonight to be a help to others. Father, we're so very thankful tonight for being able to be in this place and, Lord, to hear your word preached and its truth to impact our hearts and lives. Thank you for your people that are here tonight. And I thank you for how you've spoken to needs in this place and met needs tonight. Now, Father, bless as we go out of this building into life, Lord, to share what we have heard here tonight. I pray you bless Brother Eddie as he hurries now to uh, fellowship there in East Ridge and bless him as he shares with the people there about missions tonight and bless the church there in their mission effort in these days. Thank you again, Lord, for your grace in our lives. We love you because you first loved us. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Shake hands and fellowship.